Good morning once again. But you're tired of seeing me. Well, <laughs> well let's see. So the question for this morning, the idea that we're going to meditate on is something that's very important for all of us to really think about and deeply and sincerely. And I hope that this is something um, that's a starter for you. I don't want this to be the end-all be-all. I want this to be something that you take through the week, through the month, and you just meditate on it, pray about it, search the scriptures on, because I think it's a very important topic. And it's the question, can man be right before God? And uh, first segue, <laughs> I want to talk about Fritz Haber. Does anyone know who Fritz Haber is? Raise your hand. Okay, Phew. I was counting on y'all not knowing this one. So <laughs> Fritz Haber was a German of Jewish descent, and he was a famous chemist. He was a brilliant chemist. There's a picture of him. He looks like a smart dude. I don't know. Just look at him. Haber was awarded a Nobel Prize in chemistry for the development of the Haber-Bosch Bosch method. Has anyone ever heard of that, Haber-Bosch method? No? Okay, very good. This method that, that was developed by him and, and Bosch is responsible to this day for feeding half of the population of the earth, the methods that he developed. It was extracting nitrogen from, from the air, and he created fertilizer and all these different methods for agriculture that is used to this day, and who was fed. Because of his work, half the population is fed, and that's an absolutely amazing thing. But you might know him better from his other claim to fame. Any guesses on that one? The father of chemical warfare. Oh, we got one. Okay. <laughs> We've got a smarty pants in here. <laughs> but yes, the father of chemical warfare. So that's, does that give anyone pause? Like, <laughs> I, I, you know, you don't expect that. A Nobel Prize winner for feeding half the population and also known as the father of chemical warfare. So he's a Nobel Prize winner and also like a war criminal. Very odd. Those things don't usually pair up together. He developed deadly gases that were heavier than air in order to get past the trench deadlock during World War I. If you remember your history classes, the trench warfare was a big deal, and they got st stalemated for the longest time, and this is kind of what helped them on the French battlefront especially. And this method was later used. Here's the irony. Remember, he was Jewish. He was of Jewish descent. He fled the country during World War II as the Nazi party started coming to um, power. And they actually used Haber's method for chemical warfare to use the gas to in the Holocaust uh, during in the concentration camps. So that's extremely ironic to me. But the question that I can't help but think of is how are you supposed to judge this man? Right? Which on the scales of justice, on one hand, half the population is fed to this day because of that man's work because of his science, because of his research and the things he developed. But on the other hand, he's responsible for the death of millions of people or contributed to it. Do they cancel each other out? Do they wait? Does, is, do you base it on numbers? Do you base it? How do you judge this morality? On what basis will this man be judged? And what I hope that, that you're doing through this is not focusing so much on Fritz Haber, but questioning yourself. Because I think we can all admit we as humans are a mixed bag. We're, we're, we're very confusing. You know, you may get up and like do a lot of volunteer work, help out, pray for people, and then at home you snap and you yell at your wife or your kids or, you know, you have low moments, you have high moments, and you just go back and forth and you're like, I'm a mess, right? I'm like back and forth. I, I, the very thing I want to do is the thing I don't do. The very thing I don't want to do is the thing I do. And I keep it's this, oh, how does God view me? How does God judge me? Will he, will he judge me based on my best days when I'm on fire, when I'm zealous, when my prayer life, I'm keeping myself in self-control, I'm exhibiting Christ, or based on my low moments where I just had my moment in the flesh and went on a tirade or completely indulged in my own selfish lust? What am I going to be based on? How is God going to judge me? What's the basis? Because again, we're confusing creatures. We're not all bad, but we're not all good. We're a mix of both. And this comes from Job 4, 13 through 17. And I've always loved this passage. And it's Eliphaz's, I believe, dream here. He says, Amid thoughts from visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, dread came upon me, and trembling which made all my bones shake. A spirit glided past my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. 
Then I heard a voice, already terrifying. Who would like me? Oh, man, <laughs> I'd like, be absolutely terrifying. It's dead quiet, and he hears this. Can mortal man be right before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? That question's always stuck with me. He saw this in a dream. Like, how freaked out would you be if you had this dream, right? Like, oh, man, that would make your bones shake in your body as well. I want to point at some words that Jesus said on, on synagogue. When he went to the temple, he got the scroll of Isaiah. It says, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. So he's in his hometown. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet, verse 17, Isaiah, was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he said to them, doubtless, verse 23, you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his, in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, verse 25, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. By the way, they, they're mad. <laughs> After they hear this, they are mad. They try to throw Jesus off a cliff. So Matthew adds an extra flavor to this account, or an extra aspect. In Matthew 13, 58, same account, it says, And he did not do many mighty works there. Why? Because of their unbelief. So this sets the tone. Jesus is bringing up Zer the widow of Zarephath and Naaman as examples of faith. Because he says in Israel, God didn't send them to any of them. Yet to these Gentiles, God sent them and God cleansed them, healed them, blessed them. Jesus is proclaiming the fulfillment of God's plan, right? The good news to the poor, to set free the captives, to liberate the oppressed. Right? That's all, read Isaiah, Ezekiel, that's all these visions looking forward to what the Messiah would do. And he is faced with unbelief in his own hometown, and he cites two examples of God's salvation, of God providing and healing and uh, taking care of the oppressed, setting the captive free. And that's the widow of Zarephath, Zarephath and Naaman. So why would Jesus point to these two people as examples of the salvation that he's bringing, right? Because these are a type. They're a type. He's using that in the context of what he has just said. At synagogue. So very quickly, let's look at the widow of Zarephath. So remember, Elijah calls this famine. There's a famine. Everyone's, you know, very anxious for food. And it says, then the word of the Lord came to him, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. Okay, why is this shocking? Where's Sidon? <laughs> not in Israel, right? It's not part of their territory. This is Gentile territory. And yet God sends him there. And verse 14, it says, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent. This is Elijah telling this widow there. She's, remember, she's just collecting sticks and a little bit so they can eat their last meal and die. Like, we're just going to eat this and die. And he says, hey, share it with me. <laughs> what? <laughs> Buddy, I don't know if you looked around. There's a famine. I don't see an abundance. But Elijah says, thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel. Well, why should that matter to her? That, she's not in Israel. That's not her God. right? Her God is the God of Sidon. That's who she worships, and yet he says the God of Israel, Yahweh of Israel, he's going to provide. The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty. Verse 15, and she went and did as Elijah said, and she and her household ate for many days. So she obeyed. Do you think it's because Elijah was so compelling or because she was just so eager to share? I think she's heard an account or two about Yahweh of Israel. And I think she realizes, oh, he is God. <laughs> he is true. And she obeyed because of her faith in who Yahweh is. Out of all the widows of God's elect Israel, you think about this. This was a chosen nation, right? Only one Gentile widow had an abundance during that era. And combining what Jesus says in Matthew 13, why is that? 
Well, because of their unbelief. This was a time in Israel of unbelief. So God sought belief elsewhere among the Gentiles. And, you know, that's really, there's a whole bunch of foreshadowings, by the way. You know, the Gentile inclusion shouldn't have been a shock as much as it was at the time. So then the second one, and this one's very powerful to me. It's Naaman, the Syrian general. All right, Syria was a big time enemy of Israel. They did a lot of damage to Israel. And so he's not just like a citizen living in Syria, you know, who doesn't have much involvement in the wars or the politics. He's just trying to farm his land and live in peace. No, this is a commander of the king's army. He's a high ranking official in Syria. And remember, Naaman had the terrible disease of leprosy, and he's miserable. And then finally, his Israelite slave girl that he captured, kidnapped, <laughs> During a raid on Israel, it's like, hey, you big dummy, go to Israel. There's a prophet who can heal you. And so he goes, and he's not greeted by the prophet. Remember that? A servant greets him. It's just funny. You see how many times Naaman deals with servants <laughs> and not high up. There's kind of this subtle humbling going on. And so and remember, it's a servant Israelite girl. And then here it's, it's uh, Elisha's servant, remember, Gehazi. And he's, he says, hey, uh, my master says to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. And he's not happy. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to meet me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. I think that's just like the funniest way. Like wave his hand all like, ooh, like some like magic ritual or something. And he didn't get it. But again, the servants talk sense into Naaman. So again, you see that kind of humbling here. And he washes seven times in the Jordan River. And then on the seventh time, it says his skin is like smooth as a baby's. <laughs> He's got baby skin. That'd be amazing. Imagine going from leprosy to like, I don't know, you see those like lotion commercials all the time. You're like, There's no way it actually does that. But yeah, that's what his skin looked like. And verse 15, it says, Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, pay attention to this, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. That's a huge statement. Because back then, politics and religion, there wasn't a separation of church and state or temple and state. Your temple was your state. Your politics were your religion. Your God informed how you ruled your society and your culture. And he's saying, there are no gods besides the God of Israel, Yahweh of Israel. And this is the very interesting part. Verse 17, the Naaman said, if not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth, dirt. He's asking for dirt. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt or offerings or sacrifice to any god but Yahweh, but the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. So he's saying, listen, will God forgive me? Will Yahweh forgive me for this? When my master goes into the house of Ramon to worship there, that was the, that was the Syrian's god. That's what their politics, everything, culture was formed around. Leaning on... Uh, Ramon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Ramon. So obviously it's assumed that the king was very elderly, so he'd be assisting him in there. And the king would bow down, so he would also have to bow down to help him down and back up. He says, when I bow myself in the house of Ramon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. So what did he already say? I'm not worshiping any other god but Yahweh. From now on, that's it. But I do have to go into the idol's temple and i have to bow down but does god know does yahweh know that i'm not bowing down to that god i'm not worshiping that god so he's concerned about this and he knows that yahweh is the god of israel so he wants israel to go with him through the dirt so that way god will be with him so that's how sacred geography worked in the day but he's that concern does god know that i know he wants to know if yahweh knows that he knows <laughs> like does, does yahweh understand that i'm not bowing down to that god and this is what Elisha says to him. Shalom. Go in peace. Don't worry about it. God knows. You know. Go in peace. And this cannot be over, overemphasized at all. You think about that Jesus cited this example to these Jews, right, who have already been indicted for their unbelief. He's saying, I saw belief in the Gentiles. So this Gentile who will never set foot in the temple never be circumcised, never celebrate Sabbath, and never go to any Jewish feast was considered a paradigm of faith by Jesus. And why was this? Because he says there is no God but Yahweh of Israel. He's the only God that I'm going to serve. There was more faith in Naaman 
than the Israelite nation as a whole at that time, right? Because they were plagued with idolatry. They were worshiping all kinds of gods, and they were living in Israel. And here's this pagan who had worshipped Ramon his whole life is worshiping Yahweh and Yahweh alone. So you can see why Jesus is interweaving these two people as examples of faith. So on what basis was he judged before God? How well he kept Torah? Enslavement of Israelite children on the scales? How did God view him? Shalom. Peace. The only basis for his salvation was based in his faith, faith that Yahweh was the only God that he would serve for the rest of his life. He had made that decision. And I think of Romans 5 eight. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's pay attention to what this verse does not say. But God shows his love for us in that while we were getting our act together, Christ died for us. What about this one? But God shows his love for us in that while we were doing our very best, Christ died for us. That's not what he says. He shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What is our hope for salvation? What is the basis of how we will be judged? How does God view us? I think the, a very helpful way to view this, if you ever wonder about this, is to look at David and Saul, King David and King Saul. I made a spreadsheet here, and this is, just, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's just a list of blunders, of sins that both committed. So David committed adultery with Bathsheba, arranged for the murder of her husband, Uriah, showed cowardice by not dealing with his son Amnon's wickedness, counted the people of Israel in direct disobedience to the command, right? They were not supposed to census the people, and David did, big time. Job even warned, Joab even warned him, hey, don't do this, it's not a good idea, and David still persisted in it, resulting in a punishment. And a lot of Israelites died because of that decision. Attempted to cover up his sin with Bathsheba by deceitfully arranging for Uriah's death. That's pretty terrible stuff. What about Saul? He offered a sacrifice without waiting for Samuel, the prophet violating religious law. Well, again, David really did the same thing by eating the bread of presence. Jesus says that was unlawful for him to do so. He displayed fear and hesitation in facing Goliath. He acted jealously and attempted to kill David multiple times due to envy and David, I mean, yeah, David actually did kill somebody who was righteous. Consulted a medium, a practice strictly forbidden by Jewish law. Which of their sins were worse? What's the word? How do you base it? An attempted murder or actual murder? Breaking this law of Torah or breaking that law of Torah? They were both sinners before God. On a scale of it, they were both sinners. So how were these two sinners judged? Well, if you look at what happens in 1 Samuel 16, 14, it says, Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. God left him. Yet, whereas David, we know a man after God's own heart, and we read the Psalms, and look how David even describes it. I know that you delight in me. How can David say that? How on earth can he say that? Think of how David and Saul responded throughout their life to their sins. What was Saul notorious for? Blaming, 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 avoiding, never owning up, never taking accountability. David takes accountability all the time for his sins. He pours out, I mean, you can read it in the Psalms. I sinned, I'm, I'm, I'm wicked, I was born in wickedness, I'm so utterly wicked, I was wicked from the womb. And yet he can also say the Lord is gracious to me or the Lord delights in me. Why? It's because he always sought Yahweh through his mistakes through his sins, he never stopped seeking Yahweh. Saul gave up pretty early. So there's not really much an attempt on his part to do the right thing or to even step down for David or to confess. We even see that with wicked kings. Even Ahab for a time repented, and who, who's like one of the worst of the worst of the kings. And God showed him mercy during that time, and then he went right back to it, of course. But we see that there's a very different attitude. Even though... Their sins, I mean, you can't really weigh out which one's worse. They're both kind of did horrible, horrible things. And yet one was a man after God's own heart, and one God departed. So David, the king of God's elect people, Naaman, the pagan warrior, were justified on the same basis. Galatians 2.16, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus, 
in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. And I hear Christians say this a lot. I hear, I hope I go to heaven, or I hope I'm saved. And if, if you're like me, you're one of many Christians who has been chronically anxious about, it, am, am I really saved? Am I lost? Am I going to hell? And I think there's a ton of Christians who feel that way. But this stems from one of three reasons. I think there's only three options in this. One, you doubt the power of Christ's blood. You don't think that Jesus' blood can actually wash away your sins or actually has the power to forgive your sins. Second, you serve other gods or no god at all. In other words, idolatry, you serve after your own lust, you know, whose god is their own belly, their own desire, their own appetite. You follow that. You, you uh, pinch a... No, never, never mind. Huh? Bad analogy. Or finally, you have a works-based salvation mindset. I think that's one of... That, those are the three options. And I'm just going to assume that for this audience that you don't doubt the power of Jesus' blood. And I'm going to say that you're sincerely seeking Christ and to obey him and to love him and to love your neighbor. So I'm going to mark the second one off. I think that leaves you have a works-based salvation mindset. When Christians say, I hope I go to heaven, what is really being said is, I hope I've done enough to be saved. Now, we might not outright say that, but that is what's being communicated. And I want us to really meditate on this. Isaiah 64, 6, he says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our wicked deeds, what deeds? Righteous deeds. All our good deeds, all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. I'm going to say the Hebrew is a lot harsher than the word polluted, by the way. So if you have a Strong's, look it up and be grossed out. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Whatever righteousness we have is like a filthy garment before the holiness of God. And Paul says in Romans 3.10, he's quoting scripture, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. The danger that goes with thinking that you've done all the right things, so you, therefore you have a hope of being saved, is thinking that you've done all the right things. That's the danger of it. And that only leads to pride or despair. There's only two options with that way of thinking. In Hebrews 9, 7, it says, But into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself, and this is the important part, and for the unintentional sins of the people. See, on the Day of Atonement, it wasn't just what they knew they did wrong. It was things that they hadn't even thought of, that they had broken the law, that they had broken points of Torah and hadn't even realized. Do you think that we have unintentional sins that we just are blind to or that will be revealed at some point but we're not even aware of or we didn't think about or that we forgot about? We still commit unintentional sins. In 1 John 1.18, he says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. When we stand before God in judgment, none of us will stand before him without sin. Whether intentional or unintentional, there's something in our lives that we had not image, imaged Jesus perfectly on. And to believe otherwise is to believe that every thought, every action of every second of every day has been exactly identical to Christ. To what Christ would have thought, to what Christ would have said, to what Christ would have done of every single microsecond. Raise your hand if you're doing that. Perfectly. Every single time. No. No. You think you have, you're a liar, right? The truth is not within you. You've deceived yourself. None of us will stand before our creator blameless in our deeds. And that's why Paul says in Ephesians 2 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's not you. It's the gift of God. But what are about what about our works? Because obviously it doesn't it's just like Paul said. Is this a license to sin? God forbid. No. No, we're supposed to have an aversion to sin. But why we do things directly correlates to how we do things. If you think, I worked at Chick-fil-A, and we had to say my pleasure. It's a nasty habit. I still do it to this day sometimes. It slips out. But why we do it, you know why we do it? Well, it's to make the guest feel welcome, to feel, you know, like they, it's higher up, right? It's a nicer experience. You know why? So that way they'll pay more money, right? So that way we can charge a premium because of the service. There's a selling point. There's a marketing aspect to it. And if I were to stop saying my pleasure and the staff stopped saying my pleasure, well, then people would be less willing to pay the Chick-fil-A premium for their stuff because they're not getting the same experience. 
So if you understand why saying my pleasure is important and realize that we got to keep money up, that way they can keep paying me, right? Keep my salary up. You understand? All of a sudden, you're a lot more motivated to be consistent with the rules of the company because you understand the purpose and the goal. Whereas if you don't think about it that deep, it's just a chore. It's really annoying to do. So, you know, you do it half-heartedly. The why we do something defines what we do and how we do it. I want to show an example of this, two examples. 1 Corinthians 6.15 says, Paul says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. And this is the what? Flee from sexual immorality. What are we supposed to do? Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that? And here's the why. Here's the why we do the what or don't do the what. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. He doesn't say, don't, you know, don't engage in sexual immorality, immorality. That way the Spirit can indwell in you. It's don't commit sexual immorality because the Spirit dwells in you. That's insane for you to do. Don't sin. Don't be engaged in that. Or Ephesians 4.29. Here's the what. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Why? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You grieve the Holy Spirit because he's in you. That's why you don't speak wickedly. That's why you don't let corrupting talk come out of your mouth to tear down, to bring down, to insult, to curse. It's the exact opposite because the Spirit dwells within you. We don't do good things to be saved. We do good things because we are saved. When we do our deeds, when do our deeds affect our salvation? What's the relationship between that? I want us to consider this. Ephesians 5.31, Paul says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He's speaking about marriage and the marriage covenant. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. If you say you love your spouse, but you constantly cheat, him, cheat on them, you hit them over the head with a baseball bat, at what point is your spouse going to say, I'm starting to think you don't really love me? At what point? Think about that. When do your deeds match your actions? Or, <laughs> that was redundant. When do your actions match your words, your heart? If you say, oh, honey, I love you so much. Whack. Oh, I love you so much. That's not love. Your actions are exhibiting that you don't have faith. See, true faith is one that exhibits, that outpours good works and good deeds because the faith is there, because the love is there, because you know the Father, and the Father you know, knows you. If we serve the God of self daily, yet say we believe in God, do you think you really have faith? Do we think we really have faith? In 1 John 5, 16, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. How is there sin that doesn't lead to death? A Christian, a Christian who's justified by Christ's blood, by the grace of God, that's how there's a sin that doesn't lead to death because it's one who's sincerely following God for one who sins and he comes to his attention he prays, he repents, he turns away from that, or maybe it's even unintentional sin. God forgives, but that doesn't excuse continual sin. And First John says as well that he who makes a practice of sinning is a slave to sin. In other words, you serve other gods. You serve yourself. So there's options. You serve Yahweh, you serve other gods, or you serve yourself. That's the options for you. And if you're serving God, if you, like Naaman, are saying, Yahweh is the only God, I will never worship any other. I won't worship self. I won't worship other gods. I won't prioritize them. I prioritize Yahweh and his will for my life. I prioritize Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the basis of our salvation. To answer Eliphaz's question, how can man stand blame, blameless before his creator? He says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So if you feel like I'm saying you can sin... Don't sin. All right? Everyone clear on that. Don't sin. Sin bad. Don't do it. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, 
Jesus Christ the righteous. He, not your good works, not anything you can do, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. Naaman had faith. And it was because of that faith that he washed in the Jordan River. That's faith. That's, that's all one thing. It's not separate things. That washing was faith because he believed in Yahweh. We too must have faith by washing ourselves in Christ's blood, which is our propitiation. He's our intercessor. He's our great high priest who sympathizes with us in our struggles, in our weaknesses, at the lowest points of our lives because he was the perfect sacrifice. He was the fulfillment of faith that we can have faith. And we do that through baptism. We wash away our sin. Well, we're not washing away our sins. It's an appeal to God for a good conscience. We, we are submerged into the water and raised up a new creature just as Christ was buried and resurrected. So my question for you, we're all going to stand before God with good and bad things we've done. It's so simple. We all stand before God's sinners. No way out of it. But the only way to be justified, to be judged in a way that leads to life, is that Christ is your Lord and Savior. That God is the only God who you worship, who you prioritize, who you seek covenant and relationship with and faithfulness with. It's only by Jesus that we can be saved. If you want to be, come into relationship with him, we ask that you come forward and be baptized as we stand, number, uh, stand and sing number six.